since I'm super late, um, you might still be able to hear the dog. I thought she was quiet, but then turns out she was just waiting for me to start my stream to start singing the song of her people again. I've taken her out twice now. It's usually she wakes up and I take her for a walk and then she goes to sleep and then she wakes up very briefly and goes to sleep again. Um, but she didn't want her breakfast this morning so then I had to feed her later. It, it's like she predicts when I want to do something that's not involving dogs and makes herself known. Um, I'm just getting to the point where I can paint on my own in the studio with the dog, but I don't think that I'm really quite up to painting with the dog in here and streaming. So I am trying to get this going while she naps. Um, and usually this would be her nap time. But she's been difficult. She's been a little weird this whole day. So, so you're hearing the dog now. Um, I might have to step out and take her out again. In which case, I guess the camera will come with me. But I'm trying to avoid that because she really should settle. But... I think she's hearing my voice and thinks something is happening with our dogs. Um, so on Discord and in the thumbnail of this video, I included a photo of that little crying wolf with a shaggy ink cap mushroom um, and some other photos that I took of those mushrooms. I've also got a sketch that I did some time ago um, in black and white um, but I thought I would do just a quick watercolor sketch um, to show some of the interesting browns and violets that show up in these mushrooms. Um, this will be just a very quick sketch in this little sketchbook um, because again I can't probably can't stay too long due to the dog so I'm just going to rearrange my setup here a tiny bit. Um, my desk is a mess because it's where I've been tossing all the things that I don't want the dog to access. Um, and I have to go plug in my lights right now because they are usually in the dog area. So that's another reason why I am um, not... Uh, not having her in here is that I would be worried that she would chew on power cables, um, which we haven't rerouted yet. So I usually just lift them out of the way because I don't need the studio lights when I'm not filming. Anyway, um, so I'm just going to set up a tiny bit more and hopefully that dog will shut up. everyone's week slash month been? Oh, sorry, I just need to make sure everything's plugged into the right places. Um, oh, that's not what I needed to plug in. What I needed to plug in was this, which instead of being on top of the dog kennel, has to be right beside the little subtle spot. Okay, well, here we go. We have a little bit more light. Okay, that's a little bit better. Can you see the chat? Um, and I'm just going to put up a few notifications because I'm starting so late. I'm just going to go post a little update on Discord to say that I am now streaming.
mind. Well, um, so that's that. And I guess I'll just get started. Who this is? Sorry about this terrible soundtrack. I promise I'm not actually juicing any dogs. She's got her comfortable bed. Yes, Ember's singing. She does that. Um, she, her behavior is very, very, very border collie. She looks not border collie, but she, Misha and I are out on the porch. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, I, oh, that's not a nice color. Um, let's try that again. A different combination of things that is less yucky. Um, yeah, Amber's behavior is very border collie except for that. That is all the other side and the fact that she never gets cold, um, which I think might also be contributing to just how um, not asleep she is. Uh, is I think that because it's cooler out, like the change in weather, she's more active um, when it's cooler. So um, I'm not totally sure, but I suspect that I might have to start exercising her more because she just sort of wilts in the heat. Um, and I hope it's not too much more. She's definitely, like, she's definitely still, we have not been running our, um, furnace at all. Um, so it hit eight degrees the other night and we had the windows open and we haven't been running our furnace. Um, she still doesn't get cold. She is more willing to snuggle. She likes the concept of snuggling, but she can't handle it usually because she gets too overheated. Um, Misha's been visiting a lot recently, I guess. Anyway, um, Amber has her days. Uh, if she drives Jordan too crazy, I might just have to go over there for a while um, with her. Um, he seems to be handling her a little bit better just this past few days, but I think he's actually going to take her out, which is nice. Nice for me. So, a cat mushrooms. They have Charlotte's mama to a climate march and then to pick up cookies. Oh, cookies are delicious. I love cookies. Yeah, so Jordan's gone to deal with Amber, which is really nice. Um, Generally, she's my responsibility, but it's nice when she's yelling, but I'm not the only person who can deal with this. Um, I am going to have to switch out this water because it's gotten really, really green, which is not the color I'm going for. Yeah, 
about that. A real, uh, real exciting day today. Anyway, <laughs> that's that. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is probably going to be a slow stream. Why did I not fill this all the way? Oh, because Jordan's out in the other room cleaning up some puddle that shouldn't be pee. We're not sure if it's pee. She manages to spill water all the time and like generate water. We're not sure where it comes from. <laughs> Just a moist animal. Very well hydrated. Anyway, um, yeah, so. You don't, like, if she just whines, she just whines, right? And if she pees on the bedroom floor, she just pees on the bedroom floor, and then I have to deal with it later. She shouldn't have to pee on the bedroom floor. So hopefully that won't happen. But you never know. She's kind of a brat. Okay, um... Let's get at some other brushes. Yeah, so I haven't streamed in a while and then I'm starting super late, so probably this will be fairly quiet, which is fine. It'll also be fairly short. Um, I just do want to get back into the habit of streaming ever. I'm trying to get like a granulating gray violet color here. Um, I was reading up on dog colors. Uh, so border collies, because I have a little border collie mix. Um, their most common color is uh, that characteristic black and white. Um, so I am just going direct to watercolor and not trying to just be very, um, loose and quick about the sketch again because I don't really know how long I will have and if I really have to go attend to the dog. Um, not we doing anything with the um, like I'm not pre-drying anything this isn't going to be super precise or anything I'm just trying to get as much detail sorry so what I was saying I was looking into um, dog coloring, dog, no, dog breed details more than anything, and um, border collies because, because of the border collie mix, um, and border collies are most frequently seen in that characteristic black and white. Um, but they actually have this huge range of acceptable colors. Like it's one of the largest, like most widely accepted ranges of colors. Like some, some um, kennel clubs will just actually allow any coloring for border collies. Uh, some have a list of acceptable colors, but in that those cases, it's like there's eleven colors or something. So, um, we 
which is interesting. A lot of them I'd never seen before. Um, uh, Ember's mother is a Border Collie, and she's not the black and white. She is brown and white. Her dad is mostly white uh, with a with some black detailing, um, but he is mostly Canadian Inuit dog, um, which is another one of these breeds that just has like this huge genetic range of different acceptable things. In fact, um, the, the Canadian Inuit dogs, um, any coloring is, is acceptable. I mean, they're only recognized by the uh, Canadian Kennel Club. They're not recognized anywhere else anymore. They used to be. Um, they're just very uncommon. So uh, there's just was, wasn't enough Dogs to justify maintaining um, competitions and other other kennel clubs. Um, anyway, so her dad is black and white, sort of white, mostly white, with some black splotches. Her mom is. Um, the fairly, the, like, the more, most stereotypical, um, sort of patterning of border collies, because they can also have all kinds of different shapes to their coloring, um, but in brown and, like, reddish brown in and white, rather than in... Black and white. Um, and then Ember has some dilute brown and some dilute uh, black hair, so gray and then this sort of tawny sable color. Um, and that mix, it turns out, is referred to as lavender in dog coat colors, which is interesting. Uh, she also has white. She also has spots on her belly and stripes on her legs. Um, and like little patches of darker black areas. Um, she's just got like a wild, wild range of different fur detailing. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And then, uh, the, these mushrooms have a sort of similar coloring. Now, this is not what I would call lavender in any, um, like if I was classifying co colors. Likewise, this paint, this cobalt lavender from Sela paint is not really what I would tend to think of as lavender. Um, but it is an interesting color that's interesting to try to replicate, and I'd noticed it um, the previous time I sketched um, these mushrooms, but I hadn't gotten around to painting it, painting them in um, watercolor. I'd only done this ink sketch, so I decided to try to create that lavender color, like my dog. That is not lavender. So yeah, she's also decided to get quiet now that hi, Leah Hut, a live stream indeed. It seems somebody needs to learn how to be less jealous. Yes, somebody does need to learn to be less jealous. Hi, everyone. Um. Yeah, uh, so this is probably going to be a fairly short stream. Um, I've been rambling on a bit about 
colors that aren't lavender and dog breeds. Um, because my entire life is dog right now. Um, but got a cute dog. He's adorable. In Quiller's 2008 book, he says he goes through more tubes of PV14 than any other paint. Is that because his work ends up featuring a lot of it or just because it's low tinting? That's really interesting. I haven't used very much of it, but I have been going through a lot of Potter's Pink. Um, which was a paint that I totally, like, I was, you know, just allergic to the concept of initially. Um, I just really didn't want to, um, deal with, uh, any kind of, um, Like these low tinting, heavily granulating things, it, it's taken me a while to warm up to them. But they are really handy when you're trying to do um, like these soft color transitions in sort of organic patterns. Um, you know, not super smooth subjects, but anything that's got these sort of modeled textures um, with like hints of little bits of color popping through. I find it's really a lot easier to work that with some lower tinting, heavily granulating sort of lifting paints um, rather than trying to dilute a very transparent, um, high tinting, staining paint, uh, but it's, um, yeah, that's been an adjustment because I'm really not used to, to working with them, so it's still, And I'm just splashing paint all over. Again, this is not meant to be a super um, developed piece. I just wanted to get back into the habit of streaming. So I just figured I'd get out this really teeny tiny sketchbook and do something. Yeah, I guess 2 for 2 PV14 would not keep up with PG7 or similar. He likes it with Viridian. So PV14 with PG7. I think usually PV14 is more bluish than this one. Um, so PV14 with um, Viridian. PG18 is Viridian. Um, it would give you a I mean it would be a, a like a granulating tinting version of like if I mix PV55 with uh, or sorry it would be granulating and lower tinting than this but if I mix PV55 with PG7 then I get this like cool um like tealy blue color like sorry you can't see that like this. Um, and if I add in a little bit more of the PV55, I can get something more like this. So it would be that ra same range of colors, just lower tinting and granulating. And that's a really pretty range of colors. So I can totally see that working out quite well. Um, if you want those colors, especially if you're doing like landscapes or something. Um, you know, you want to have that like that nightscape look or you're painting oceans or flowers or something like those are some really useful colors and to have them lower tinting and granulating.
a grayish green mix. So if you added more of this stuff. Sorry, I'm I, like, I don't have Viridian handy. I think I have one, two somewhere. Um, but like not even in this studio. So I'm approximating the shade. But he uses the pinkish version of PV14. So, okay. Do I have a equivalent to that? Possibly, maybe? I mean, it would be something like if you were to add a little bit more um, of the... Oh, like the... Like the cobalt violet, like the light version, like the, um, where did I put it? I have PV47 and like, it would be more like if you had, in fact, in that case, I can actually add the cobalt. Um, let's see. Okay. I can approximate that using two completely different pigments, but I can approximate that. Um, let's see. Da -da -da. Where did my paper towels go? This studio is, in some ways, the cleanest it's ever been, but in some ways, every time there's something that's within reach of the dog. I just sort of toss it on my desk. And so there's a section of my desk that's just become a dumping ground. Uh, so like the floor is all neat. Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna go. Dog loves paper towels, so I have to keep that way the hell out of her reach. Um, otherwise, never get anything done in here. And I worry because I use pigments that I don't necessarily want her to be eating. Yeah, so if I take, okay, so what I'm going to do is I have a PG26 from Sela, which is Cobalt Evergreen, which is similar to a Viridian. Um, and I have <laughs> just a rather opaque looking color that doesn't move a lot. Okay, well this one will probably move pretty well because these are Sela paints, they move quite nicely. Um, uh, but so I have, it. they are heavy pigments though. So I have this PG26, which is like um, similar to an, uh, sorry, let me pull you over. So, okay. Okay, so I have in my, I didn't mean to be very off course. I was just saying stuff. No, go ahead and bear me off course. This needs to dry. Um, before I load more stuff on it. Um, and in any case, it's not gonna be a very developed anything. So this is gonna be a fairly short stream. Um, just, you know, I do need to deal with the dog as well. Oh, sorry, I'm putting that in the wrong puddle. Um, but I have this, uh, it's also a Sailor Paint, PV47. Um, so I could use that. Or, um, what might actually be an even better match, but it's not right in front of me. Oh, no, it is right in front of me. Uh, oh, never mind. No, it's not. Um, would be the, um, Magellan Mission Gold, the P, the, whatever it is. Some high number, one, something. Um which is probably the, that cobalt violet light color that I've seen that has the most movement. Um, anyway, so this is somewhat darker. Like this is a somewhat darker version of a cobalt violet. Oh, sorry. 
and I'm having still having to add quite a bit of it. Um, Where did I put my... I'm sure I do have a tube of the Magello stuff floating around here somewhere. Not this one, so it doesn't matter. Um, but yes, by all means, hear me out, of course. Uh, these, these streams aren't really... They don't begin on the most, like, stable course to begin with. Uh, there, just for fun, it is nice to have a consistent thing, a consistent thing on my schedule every week that, like, other people are depending on, even if I'm really bad at keeping up with it. Uh, okay, I really don't know where I put all my paints. I have a stash of paints that I put away somewhere. Hit away from the dog mostly. Um, but I don't know where I put it. And I'm sure that my stuff is in there. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Back to the original sidebar. The original sidebar was if I take any kind of cobalt violet that's a little bit of the lighter shade, um, this is still gonna be a little bit brighter. So if I take, oh shoot, and I keep mixing it into the wrong thing and then wondering why it's taking so much to mix. Well, yeah, because it's got aloe in it. Uh, if I mix it in here. And then it'll have, the real version would be a little bit more muted than this. So like if I approximate that by throwing in some of the potter's pink, it would be something like this. Right? Maybe with a little bit more of the green. Is that right? So that would work. I would probably go for like one of these cobalts, like the PG-26 over uh, Viridian, um, unless you have some Viridian that re-wets really, really nicely. Um, the, uh, the M. Graham one re-wets fairly well, uh, but like any Viridian in the Canadian winter, if you're heating your house, is just gonna try to a rock. Anyway, yeah, that's a nice color. You can throw some of that in there, in here. Uh, maybe on the mushroom stem. Get some of this green in here. And some yellow. Oh. Yeah, like that. Over here. And a little bit more of this stuff here. Oh, sorry, and I'm off screen. Here we go. So, it's nice to do something that's like deliberately pretty loose and for those of you who were here at the very beginning I started this out without any kind of preliminary sketch now it is you know super simple um, and super forgiving being fairly um, amorphous blob 
with all kinds of shaggy little details. Um, but I do try to do some, you know, um, direct watercolor from time to time. I feel like it's a good, um, good exercise to um, work on, you know, some, some fears. I feel like we all have those, the, the, the like, we get afraid of screwing things up and it really messes with our ability to do our best work sometimes. Certainly that's the case for me, but I think that's a common thing. Um, and so just throwing down some paint sometimes and just letting it do its thing um, and working with what happens is nice and frees you up in the future a little bit. You need a lot of mine either it's nice to learn new mixes that work really well you need a lot of, yeah and it's kind of fun to like think about you know new things that you can try um i think we all get into sort of ruts and patterns and then sometimes we run into things that like new subjects where it's like oh how are you going to approach that and having more options you know, things you've tried, um, then when something comes up and you see a subject that has colors like this, you're like, how in the, how would I do that? You can start to approach it with the paints you have on hand. And I think it's also useful to see that reference, uh, see, see those examples like, oh, well, PV14 and Viridian, and maybe you don't have Viridian, or maybe you don't like Viridian, but you can start thinking of similar pigments or different mixes that'll get you similar effects, um, either in terms of like paint behavior or just colors. I learned from Jeff Kersius, he uses paints from the tube, and you can mix a very thick mixture of this color to counterbalance brighter greens. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you are willing to keep your Viridian in a tube and you're going to be using it direct from the tube, that works fine. Um, to be honest, the main reason why I don't do things like that is, um, I don't have the, uh, like I'm not great at keeping track of tubes if they're not just hanging on my wall at the other studio. Um, so at the other studio, I am more more likely to work um, straight from the tube. Here at home, I've mostly been sticking to paints in palettes because they can't move around on me. Um, so there's some bounce to light up from surrounding greenery here. It's kind of interesting that I'm trying to um, get across. Boy, that's quite quite a bit. Uh, maybe I'll just throw in some muting stuff and Tackling our art enemies. I'm just trying 
throwing hands and skull and human figures very difficult but i hope it will help you draw better yeah absolutely um so like i'm not a portrait artist by any means but i do find that going to life drawing sessions or like doing portrait studies is just really super useful anything that you're just like uncertain about unfamiliar about unfamiliar with like you don't have to be you know don't don't sell it to someone um but just the skills you learn from observing and painting and mixing colors and seeing shadow and light and shape um you can bring that back to subjects that you're more comfortable with um And, you know, you won't, it's not, you're not just painting whatever just for the purpose of what you're doing at that moment. Drawing is a different skill set in itself. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I feel like there's two two things going on where um like a lot of art is just seeing it's interpreting certainly in the realm of representational art a lot of it comes down to um we our eyes see colors see shapes see um patterns but we, we interpret them symbolically. So we look at a face and we see a face. We don't, we don't think about all of the shapes and shadows and whatever and all of the, the planes of the face, especially. And this is especially true with faces. Um, so training yourself to pull away from that and like, no, I don't just see a face. I see all of these shapes and these interesting colors and whatever um, can really help you, whatever you're painting usually, um, whether it's animals or, or landscapes or botanical subjects to then take that back to whatever you tend to prefer to paint or draw um, and apply that. And so if you're not, not as comfortable with drawing, you feel like you, you know, you have trouble tracing out shapes. I feel like my landscapes are about three to five years behind what I can imagine in my mind. And I think it is due to my, sorry, let me finish reading that, due to my inability to draw proportionally accurately. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good sign, probably. At least that's what I try to tell myself, is that, um, you know, if I'm disappointed with my current work, if, it, if I have an idea in my mind that I can't achieve yet, it means that I'm still working, that I'm still improving. I'm picturing the contour and jester drawings my grade nine art teacher made me do in 1971. Yeah. Um, Even those exercises, even those like art class exercises that, you know, probably seemed pretty dumb at the time. I always feel a little awkward when I'm teaching classes and I'm like, you know what you need to do? Gesture drawings. Let's do blind contours. Um, but I do, you know, like that is, <laughs> that is something that I push on people. Um, Anyway, it's been a while. I'm really sorry I've been so missing recently. Just a whole bunch of things happened. Um, yeah, it just feels like blow after blow. Um, but some of it good, some of it good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really, really actually quite pleased with my little pupper. Um, she's lovely uh, when she's not yelling or singing the song of her people. She seems to have finally fallen asleep, which is really nice. I do appreciate that. Um, 
possibly after peeing on our floor. We can't quite figure out what the fluid on the floor was. Um, which is the second time today that there's been like mysterious fluid on floors that we don't quite have a good explanation for. The other time was in the washroom, which totally would be a place that she, um, you know, she's she's gotten better at not peeing in the bedroom or in the studio, um, places that she spends a lot of time, like, you know, she's got her spot in the kitchen, she's got her spot in the studio, she's got her spot in the bedroom. Um, we tried crate training briefly, and that didn't go well. Um, but she does, she is contained most of the time. Um, we basically just put her on a tether all the time. So she's either tethered to furniture or tethered to uh, a person or shut in a trusted room. So she was shut in the bedroom and there's there was a, a mess of fluid um, that we couldn't quite explain because um, it didn't she likes knocking over her water, but her water was right side up. Um, so it's possible that she just like dipped herself in the water and then ran it down the There's a, so you probably learned a lot, yeah. Yes, exactly. So, um, a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of things like that where it's not really about creating, like there's a lot of art exercises as well. I'm sure this is any field, um, where it's not about creating a good result on your practice run, right? The practice run serves other purposes. Okay, so my screen that I'm using to reference has timed out, so I'm just going to go pull that back up again. But, but the big advice was to look more at the subject, otherwise you are drawing from imagination. Yes, absolutely. Right, so a lot of art is about observation, at least if we're talking representational art. I mean, if you're doing abstract art or um, but like any kind of representational art, whether you're doing realism or just um, like more of a looser sort of, uh, oh my goodness, expressionism or impressionism. Um, I suppose contour drawing, sorry foster this, but they could have just told us rather than just do it. Oh, well, I'm sorry that you had a bad experience with being told to do contour drawings. Um, I do try to, when I have people do contour drawings, I do try to explain why. Um, I know that there's a lot of things like that that I used to really resent. Like, I just want to paint the thing. I was 14, I had no clue why I do this. Yes, I feel like when I was a teenager, which is really the last time that I did, um, like I've done a lot of individual workshops and classes and, um, you know, botanical art type studies or, or like, um, individual courses, but it was the last time that I just had like general art training um, that was just, that wasn't like a specific, wasn't geared at a specific finished skill set. 
I guess. Um, so the last time I had like general art classes was as a teen and I did feel like I used to be very resentful of any kind of these, um, like just exercise, just do it sort of like, oh, it's going to build your skills, but how, but why? Um, very much the engineer in me. Uh, explain to me why. Explain to me why. Um, okay, so I'm actually going to use a little bit more of that uh, purpley pinky mix. That like gray stuff that I made. Um, with the Potter's Pink and the PG-14 and PG-26, the Cobalts and, uh, and Potter's Pink. Um, I might even throw in a tiny bit of the brown, so I've just got this kind of mucky mix that I'm going to start layering in in here. I feel like I need to build up more shape and as I get a little bit higher I'm going to throw in some more of the this is PR206 which is a quinacridone but it's like one of the most lifting quinacridones um, and very light valued um, so it kind of works well with, uh, with these very light um, What's his name? I'm just gonna... Let this bubble over a little. And over here. Just trying to build up some depth in here before I add too much more detail. Um, and then, yeah. Add in a little bit more of the yellow in here. Um. Okay, so I've actually got my own equipment casting shadows on my work, which is not ideal. But, oh, yeah. Something like that. Okay. And then we can just get some more of that blue in here. Some spots. Some more of that purple. I also found look at the subject very misleading. It's more about measuring, comparing, and breaking it down to substructures. Um, hmm. Okay, so it's interesting. There's so, so there's some things that I heard really early on that stuck that I that I tend to think of as really like widespread and um, used in the art world, but I've found out that some of them are not. So one of them is when I was about 7 or so, I took a, a drawing class, 7, 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there. Like I was actually like a little kid and I had a teacher who would repeat over and over, draw what you see, not what you think you see. Which is, I, I feel like it's, um, it's a, it's a different approach to looking at the subject. Um, 
because we are so tempted. We are so tempted to look at eyes and see, oh, I see eyes. And so then you're not really, you're not drawing what you see, which is, you know, an interesting shape with all kinds of different cast shadows on it. And, um, is going to depend a lot on what, what you're actually looking at. You're just drawing, you know, what you think of as the shape of an eye. You're going to draw an almond shape with a little circle in the middle. Um, and then it can look really wrong. I went to the Homer Watson School in Dune one year just for a month or so in the summer, maybe late 60s. Cool. Well, they're still around. I have a few friends who teach there. I've been asked to teach. It's sort of out of my way, so I haven't. Um, the downsides of not driving in a very car-dependent town. That was when I, where I learned watercolor came in tubes. That's interesting. Yeah, like it's, it's interesting how much, like some people will just think of watercolor as, oh, that's that stuff that comes in little pans or, oh, watercolor only, like good watercolor only comes in tubes. But no, it's the same thing. It's the same stuff. You can get it in either format. Um, so I'm just going to pull up my, my photo reference again. So I just need to let this dry a little bit. <laughs> so it's really humid out because I don't have my furnace on. Um, I'm not sure how, my, how many of you were there for that initial little uh, bit of this, but I was talking about, I have this um, puppy and she is, she's half border collie, half um, big fluffy sled dog, mostly Canadian Inuit dog. Um, and she overheats so easily. Um, so we decided to just not turn on our furnace just yet. Obviously we will when it's actually winter. Um, but we just have a cold spell right now. And so it's hit eight degrees Celsius overnight. Um, we have our windows open and we haven't had our furnace on. And we have this little puppy. She is probably about 20 pounds now, maybe just short of. Um, and even in these temperatures, she's more willing to, like in these temperatures, she is more willing to snuggle, which is quite nice. Um, she loves the concept of snuggling, but she's just, she just usually overheats too easily for it. Um, so it's nice to have some nice puppy snuggles for once, um, but then 
The other issue is that she just, um, it's clear that she is, where was I going? Any of this? <laughs> Talking about dogs? Um, yeah, sorry. So she's, she's very clearly um, quite happy with these temperatures. So I guess we are just testing to see how, <laughs> like, just how cold do you want this house to be, little one? Um, and the answer seems to be extremely cold, which is interesting. I mean, obviously, we are going to heat our house at some point. Um, we don't only have Arctic dogs in this house. We also have humans and a cat. And the rest of us are getting pretty cold. Um, though it's not. And it is, as a result, usually when it's this temperature outside, it would be super dry and my paint would be drying super fast. But instead, it's cold and it's super damp because it's been raining for days so it's like we're up near 100% relative humidity and so what happens which is kind of nice for these like granulating paints is I just have this very very long open time on my watercolors um but uh Yeah, getting this to dry today is going to be a little bit challenging. Um, Anyway, for all that I'm talking about, looking at your subject, um, yeah, it's about seeing shapes, it's about seeing patterns. Um, like actually looking, looking through your eyes, not looking through like your brain's interpretation of what your eyes see, um, and then just drawing the shapes as you actually see, like drawing, drawing the shapes of your subject as you actually see them, rather than um, you know what you think you see. Um, so right now, I'm trying to paint this, um, and it's interesting because it's uh, you know it's definitely an application of this concept. But in this case, I am not being obsessive about the, uh, you know, the exact layout of these little shingles. I'm just trying to focus on what colors do I actually see? What repeated patterns do I see? What's like the bigger shape of um, like the areas of color that I see and breaking that down um, and then just sort of working with what the watercolor is doing. So even though this is very much the same sort of concept, um, uh, you know, I am not copying each individual little shingle. Um, that's not what this exercise is about. It's about seeing, looking at the shape rather than looking at the shape, looking at the colors, looking at, yeah, breaking it down. But, you know, I understand that as, as a function of seeing. I guess. Yeah. That was a very confusing, that was a very confusing ramble I just went on. Started out with dogs and temperature and whatever. Can you tell that my brain's a little puzzled? Anyway, yeah, the last couple months have been interesting. 
that's in the garden. Got a dog. Got to adjust medication level several times. Dealing with all kinds of health issues. Keep feeling like, yeah, now, now, now's the time. Now, now, now I'm feeling a bit better. Now I'm feeling a bit better. Any day now. Any day now. Different people get the same teeth and glasses and so on. Yes, exactly. So it's, it's um, you know, if you ask someone to draw a leaf, you know, you can do this exercise right now. Um, so if you get out a paper and I say draw a leaf, um, give you a moment to go and get your pencil and do this thing. Um, but... I guarantee you that most people, even botanical artists, will say, oh, draw a leaf. Okay, I'm going to draw a leaf. It's going to be like this, and it's going to have a stem, and then it's going to have, um, you know, there, I drew a leaf. Um, and, of course, you know, you're very rarely going to see that leaf. You're going to see leaves that are, um, you know, they're curved. Uh this area is in shadow, this area is like this, like even if you've got that shape of leaf, um, you're never gonna see a leaf like this. Um, so, you know, a lot of representational art, a lot of creating a scene is, you know, you're not just gonna draw a bunch of leaves that look like this. You'd reflective, Sively draw an eyebrow or an eye or eyelash, even if the top of the glasses block them, because they're this, because they're there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. So a lot of it is like break out of what you think you are looking at. Break out of like, oh, I see an eye, so it's almond shaped and it's got this circle in the middle, and I'm gonna draw a little pupil, and I'm gonna, um, you know, depending on what you're looking at, you're or like. You know, the whites of the eye, people tend to leave them white. But the thing is, depending on the lighting, more often than not, they're not going to be white. They're going to be the shadow color coming down from the brow or whatever else is in the scene. Um, so you kind of have to, like, stop thinking about you are looking at a face and start looking at, you know, like, stop applying that filter of our brain of like oh i'm looking at a person and just see with your eyes not with your brain um and so that's why i like doing specifically i find um portrait work to be useful for me in that way um because it's not something that i'm familiar with right so it's not um i'm not going to be bringing specific trained biases like painting this you know i've painted a lot of a lot of mushrooms i've painted a lot of fungi i'm i have some idea that i'm going to apply every time i uh paint mushrooms in a way that's that i i just have the basic like the the naive the more naive um sort of assumptions about portraiture because I don't have any experience with portraiture specifically so I have the same biases as anyone else um as you know a, an untrained um six-year-old 
in terms of how I see faces because it's not something that I paint all the time. Um, whereas with painting a mushroom, I do have biases as well. Everyone does. Um, patterns that I follow that are, you know, maybe not exactly what's in this mushroom, but I'm applying, there's an extra layer of bias that I'm applying from my experience of painting this specifically, um, which I don't have for portraitures in the same way because I, for portraiture in the same way because I haven't painted a lot of portraits. Um, so in terms of breaking out of the basic um, sort of symbolic vision of the world, um, choosing a subject that you're completely unfamiliar with, choosing a medium that you're completely unfamiliar with, choosing lighting that's very weird for you, um, compositions that are weird for you, like any way that, and the point is then is not to create an attractive painting. It's just to, you're going to, it's going to be that much harder to break out of what you think you see if it's something that you've practiced thinking you see something a certain way more. It's easier to do with a subject you're less familiar with. It's easier to see where you screw up with a subject you're less familiar with. So um, whatever that is, and just switch it up and paint a whole bunch of things. And you're going to learn stuff about cast shadows when you paint, you know, the, the, the shadow cast from a brow onto somebody's eyes. You're going to learn about shapes and shadows and whatever and you can bring that back to whatever you usually paint or vice versa right if you're not if you always paint portraits and you have a given like a a style of painting portraits then maybe the way to break out and see where you can improve your portraits isn't to paint more portraits to paint something else like if you always paint portraits then maybe you need to look at landscapes and work on your perspective by painting landscapes or painting botanicals or painting something. Um, portraits are one of my go-tos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so portraits are, are great for that because everyone has biases. Everyone has an idea of what a face looks like and everyone is wrong. Um, but you are, you are exactly as naive as everyone else. Um, and you have a very clear idea then when it's off. Like when a, when a portrait is off, you know it's off. When a mushroom is off, uh, I mean, do you know this, this mushroom is off? Uh, I, I can tell you how it doesn't match the reference, but like, it looks fine. I remember an article or book looking at how the white of an eye was often anything but yeah eyes and teeth and you you look at you paint you draw something and you draw white eyes and white teeth and it looks really wrong and you don't know why it looks wrong well you kind of have to step away from this as a face and start just like like look at just areas look at colors like break away from you're looking at a face and I'm going to draw an eye now and actually draw what you see, not what you think you see. Paint what you see, not what you think you see. No cheating. <laughs> well, you know what? People do find a shorthand for portraits just like they find a shorthand for anything else um so you have your way of painting rocks or trees it might be not exactly the same it not, might not be perfectly realistic but I mean keep in mind what is that anyway like you get two photographers take a picture of the same tree and you're gonna get 
the leaves that look different, that are a different color, that are, you know, the focus is different, the the lighting is different, the angle is different, the, um, and you can start recognizing in photographer's work, like, oh, this is a work by that photographer. Um, we tend to think of realism as this thing, like, oh, well, if it's realistic, then, you know, all realism looks the same. All, if I paint a tree realistically, then there's, there's one right answer there. And it's not one right answer. We all see things differently. We all apply biases, even in our vision, even in our choice of framing and our whatever, that's fine. Um, and then of course there's all kinds of art, like there's various acceptable kinds of art and not all of them are, uh, you know, photorealism. Hi nice, everyone. I'm looking for a looser approach Artistically, there's no right or wrong with portraits, but if the proportions are off, then it is objective. Yeah, um, but I guess the point is, like, there are people who do um, caricatures, right? So they'll either play up individual, like, they'll see someone who has a really big nose, and they will paint them with an even bigger nose, Um to like emphasize what they see about that person. So there's stuff like caricatures, which is um, an applied style on top of what you see. There is, there are things like um, choices of colors or choices of angles, or um, if you think about like comic artists, are another way to think about this. Like there are all kinds of um, comic artists who have, who are painting like fairly realistic or at least, um, you know, not, not off. They are painting, they are applying a style on top of an image of a person. They're not like they're, right? It's stylized, not just, wrong um which is different from the naive six-year-old so this is the problem with people who are like oh i need to, when people talk about oh i need to find my style well no you don't you will find your style don't worry about it um but if you try to find your style and you don't know how to draw or you don't know how to see, you're going to find the same find the same style as everyone, as every naive six year old. Um, and that's not a style; that's a lack of ability, and it looks like a style, not a lack of a. Your style will find you. Yes, exactly. Cartooning and a lot of the very bold strokes and exaggerations are very stylized at times. Right, so it's not about, like, if you want to paint bold strokes, that's a great idea, paint bold strokes. But um, teaching beginners, which is not something that I do too terribly frequently, like, I tend to focus more on, like, specific skill sets rather than general, like, learn to draw. Um, But when I am doing a more general sort of teaching, I've done some some classes with kids and I've also done like nature journaling and urban sketching classes. And so in that case, you do get people who don't necessarily have any kind of art training. And that is where you most hear people talk about, like they're worried because they look at different artists who have a recognizable body of work. We're like, oh, I know who painted that. And they feel like they paint and it just doesn't look like they painted it and they're concerned about that. 
and yet your style finds you. Um, if you have a heavy hand and you like painting with bold strokes, you know, that is going to show through. Um, but you shouldn't necessarily lean into it as like, oh, well, you know, I've decided that um, every time I draw a face, I have like a clean grill of white teeth. And I've decided that that's my style. Um, because that's just, that's the same assumption that almost everyone is going to make when they start drawing. So it's not going to look like a style, it's going to look like you don't know how to draw. Um, particularly if you have a whole selection of these things, right? Like if you have a comic artist who clearly does understand how perspective works, how shadows work, how everything works, but mm -hmm. chooses to specifically draw teeth as this clean grill of teeth, um, then it looks like a style. But your style isn't a lack of knowing how to do a different thing. It's a, it's a repeated pattern of, of biases that you develop. Okay. And I need to, now that this has dried a little bit more, I am going to go apply a little bit more darker shadows um, this Sunday. I've just been reminded by my schedule. I have a, another um, Patreon stream. I missed one last month, um, which I will try to make up next month. So I'll do two next month, I think. I will do one this Sunday though, um, and I'm going to be doing a uh, negative painting stream. That's my plan. Um, So I will just, yeah, I'll be doing a, a Patreon stream. Um, so the Patreon streams, these Friday streams are, I just paint whatever I feel like painting. <laughs> um, they're a little less formal. Um, But yeah, my Patreon streams, I try to do a little bit more of a structured, like sort of like a class that I would teach, like a specific, a specific topic. And there's a structure to how this goes. And I'm not just randomly chatting about whatever enters my brain. A different structure. Um, so I have one of those coming up on. Sunday, and I will post the details and reference pictures, but I will be doing a stream on negative painting. If anyone wants to tune in, you can sign up on Patreon. Um, I My billing cycle starts at the beginning of the month, so if you are unsure if this is worth it to you, go ahead and sign up. Um, and if you hate it, you can cancel, um, and you won't be bothered. 
have. I have been a little bit neglectful on Patreon. I will make it up to my patrons, I promise, all of you. Um, but uh, I do have all sorts of fun stuff planned there. Patreon streams. Get the notice you are live. Oh, uh, yeah, don't worry about it. I started late because the goofy dog um, senses when I'm going to be doing something without her and, you know, <laughs> makes my life difficult. I love her dearly, but she's kind of a brat. Anyway, so I'm just trying to get a little bit more shadow in here, um, which is what made me think of the, the topic of the Patreon. I mean, I knew, sorry, I knew what the topic was. I just, it reminded me like, oh yeah, I'm doing a, a whole stream on this. If this is something that people are interested in, it's worth mentioning. Um, is rather than painting the shapes, rather than painting the scales, for example, on this mushroom, um, painting around them, painting where they cast a shadow, um, so sort of painting around the subject. This isn't the best example of it, um, but it is the same skill set. Um, I have some reference photos to share. Um, you can of course use your own, um, but I will be sharing some reference photos and doing a very structured stream on how I go through using the reference photos that I'm gonna be using. And you can use your own or you can follow along with mine um, for how to, how to do negative painting. It's interesting. I've I've been told that I do negative painting, like I'm, you know, that I really focus on it, that I do a lot of negative painting, and I've never thought of it in that way, or I hadn't. Um, I think like, I understand the concept, but it's not really how I think of things. Um, so it's an interesting thing to, to do. Like, for example, here, um, if you're on my Discord, I've posted the reference photo that I'm using here, um, primarily for this uh, little sketch here. So what I'm doing here, there's, a, there's an area over at the top of the mushroom that's got sort of shape showing of a more orangey tone and what I'm doing is I'm painting around it trying to get the shadow in rather than painting in that area so that's the concept of negative painting is rather than painting um you know the the subject that I guess this goes back to um the whole concept of, of uh painting what you see not what you think you see um is we tend to see features, we'll see scales, we'll see um, uh, 
shapes and often what we're actually seeing is the lighter area so if you paint focus on painting that area what you'll end up with is something that ends up too dark um so often what you kind of have to do is like separate it out and think okay no this is the right tone but the area around it behind it is darker and cooler or darker and warmer and paint around the subject and sort of um, punch in the shadows, punch in the, the background rather than um, painting the subject, painting the scales, for example, on this mushroom. Okay, so I think that this is about where I'm going to end with this. Um, been going for an hour and a half, which is a fairly short stream. Uh, Jealous Baby wants all the attention. Yeah, uh, Jealous Baby wants all the attention. She, She's like that with the cat, too. Um, although that has come in handy just now. Um, she has, mm -hmm. she gets, she's a digger. And she gets stuff in her ears and then she gets really stinky because she gets like, you know, I, I mean, I was joking about the mushroom on the right, you know, her being a mushroom because she's the, the mushrooms are almost the same size as her. Um, but uh, the other part of that joke that wasn't fully explained is that she currently has like yeast infections in her ears. She's got mushrooms in her ears. Um, so we need to clean out her ears and there's like a fluid that has to go in there and then wipes and she hates it on principle but she wants to do everything that the cat does so we've been doing all sorts of silly things like oh well we're gonna groom the cat with the dog brush because the cat doesn't mind the cat just sits there and rumbles and then I can turn around so I groom the cat and I turn around and I turn to the dog and the dog's like oh I want that too so today I wiped out my cat's ears with little dog ear wipes. Not because the cat needed it, but because the cat tolerates it and actually seemed to enjoy it. Like he was getting an ear massage, it was great. Uh, <laughs> whereas the dog was throwing a fit when I just tried to clean out her ears. But the moment she saw the cat do it, I was like, oh, okay, well, this is what we're going to do now, and calmed right down. So, yes, she's... What time do you plan the Patreon stream? Um, I think I'm going to do 3 p.m. on Sunday. Um... And I'll have to arrange with Jordan or something. Make sure that the dog's actually asleep because that one I am going to start on time. It's honestly a bit hilarious. Yeah, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. She's, she's just this ridiculous little creature. We have this tiny little ridiculous little wolf who she's like totally possessive. She doesn't want, she doesn't want us to pet the cat we try to pet the cat she's like sticking her face in but yeah she wants whatever the cat gets the cat's food is tastier mind you they both do this where like um they'll steal each other's food ember has actually stopped stealing neurons food neuron still steals ember's food <laughs> she is the center of the pack she is the, we are trying to inform her that she is the baby and that, you know, as the baby, everyone bosses her around, even the cat. <laughs> and everyone can steal Ember's food. Everyone can stick their fingers in Ember's bowls. Everyone can steal Ember's food. Obviously, I'm not going to steal Ember's food, but the cat can steal Ember's food. Um, but... Ember is not allowed to steal other people's food. Ember cannot eat off our dishes. Ember cannot eat off the cat's dishes. <sighs> Poor little Ember. Today we went to the... Have you switched foods? 
Um, oh gosh. She's such a little brat too. Like she's a little drama queen. Um, so she's, uh, she is, um, pretty good with, uh, not stealing off my plate at home, right? That's fine. But we do prepare food for her in the kitchen. Um, and sometimes if I'm making food, like I'm making, there are, there are human foods that she has, right? So like she has peanut butter, she has, um, small amounts of cheese. She'll get some carrots. Uh, what else? Like a lot of fruits and vegetables, she'll get small quantities of, um, unseasoned meats like if they don't have garlic and onion and stuff in them and then I'll prepare Kong toys with for her that have like chicken stock and peanut butter and whatever in them um like freezer toys so she'll be in the kitchen she'll watch me make her food or make food generally for people including the dog people or the cat whatever and so she knows that like whatever's going on on the counter there might be food in it for her so she gets really salty when I'm making food not for her like you know yesterday I made pasta that had a sauce in it that has garlic like no part of it was acceptable or palatable to to dogs like I'm not gonna feed her pasta I'm not going to feed her garlicky pasta sauce I'm not gonna feed her I mean like she's welcome to have uh we had like greens and like vegetables in it but it was like broccoli and and kale and whatever like not things that the dog wants right she was so salty about like not being able to have that and then this morning we went to a, there's a cafe down the street um, that is very dog friendly. Like the, the, the owners are really dog lovers. So they have this um, little like box of treats at the entry. They have a dog bowl with water. Um, and the last couple times we've actually been avoiding it. I've been avoiding it for a little while because the the last couple times we went, the owners were there with some of their friends. Um, there's a portion of the patio there that they were sitting with their friends and their two dogs. And um, they were great. They had... Uh, and Bert, like, cause I go into the bakery to get my food and leave the dog out on the patio. Um, and like, I can tether her to something, but I usually, if there's somebody there, I'll just often just leave her with somebody. Just, it feels a little bit nicer than just leaving a puppy tethered outside alone. Um, so, the owners there were great and like really excited about, oh yeah, she can come sit with us while you go get the, get your food. But they not only were feeding her from the um, box there, the, the box of dog treats, but they were also, um, they also keep like giant bags of other treats. And so they were giving her like, oh, well, here's a chunk of whatever, like, you know, it's, it's, it's as big as one or two of her meals, completely ruining her appetite. And just, um, like, usually I make a big point of, you know, she needs to sit, she needs to perform for treats and she gets small treats and often she'll just get her food, um, and you know, certain behaviors that I expect when she meets other dogs. And it really caused a bit of an issue because 
they were eager to take on this the puppy but then they're feeding her all sorts of food like just massive quantities of treats and they have their two dogs and they're just letting her jump all over them um so ember loved it and every time we'd walk in that general direction she'd start pulling towards the cafe because oh well that's great like i want to go there they get <laughs> give me treats they give me whatever um and like i'm trying to teach her leash manners and that's not helpful um so today we circled around the place like doing weird loop-de-loops around the place until she stopped pulling <laughs> finally went in and that the 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 like owners friends whatever area they weren't there so we sat down there we had another there was another table another couple came by and it was very clear that the owners had been serving her like baked goods off the table too like not just dog treats because the moment the other people sat down she was like big puppy dog eyes like oh please 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 can I have your baked goods um which she doesn't do with me and I told them like don't you know she 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 gets fed plenty she doesn't need this stuff and she needs to know that like she can't just eat stuff she can't just get stuff off the table <sighs> And so, you know, I had a very cooperative couple on the table next to me and they said no. And then she does this big, you know, put upon drama queen act where she's just like, how? I'm just a poor little puppy. Nobody loves me. <laughs> She's ridiculous. She's a drama queen and she's <laughs> hilarious. We love her, but uh, yeah. She has never had anything to eat in her life. Yeah, and then you tell her no and she flops over on her side and huffs. Like, she's got this absurd attitude. Like, behavior-wise, so she's half border collie, half sled dog behavior wise she's like a thousand percent border collie in terms of training in terms of um she she does this staring thing she tries to herd me when we're walking she's very border collie except that attitude the like she sings songs and huffs and throws herself sideways and when she doesn't get like she tries to do her tricks before we've set a command. So if she gets it wrong, she'll huff and like flop over. Like, well, I give up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very, like, very, very drama queen. Um, It's kind of hilarious, but you know, sometimes, sometimes she just needs to sleep and not be the center of attention. She has a lot of personality. She definitely has a big personality. It's hilarious and it's cute because she's so tiny. Um, but I do worry, like, you know, when she's a bigger dog, like, I, <laughs> we need to go for a walk. We need to go for a walk where I want to go for a walk. You can't just be giving me attitude because you want to go there and get the fruit treats. So. Can we see her before you leave? Um, yes, probably. Sorry, let me arrange that. Here's my... Um, yeah, I will cover this up and clear off some area and oh you know what i'll do is i'll swing you around to a section of floor here so she's in the bedroom right now um she's pushed her 
she's pushed her mat, so she has a, a bed here with a slipper that she's, this is her slipper, and this is Ember's slipper that she's, uh, yep, she is working on that slipper. Um, she has her little bed thing here that she has moved to under the, under the desk. Um, I had put her crate under the desk, but she doesn't like the crate, so we're giving up on, we've given up on crate training. Uh, anyway, here's the dog spot. I will be back with the dog. She sings to the crate. Yeah, I'll go get the dog. It's probably time for her to wake up anyway. So here is a paw and a cute little face. Cute little face. Cute little belly. It's just, oh, you're getting big. Cute little belly. Look at these spots. Look at these spots. Little Dalmatian spots. Because you're ridiculous. You have ridiculous coloring. Look at the baby. Baby. Wait, sings? Oh, yeah, sled dogs do this thing. Um where they sing, they don't, like, they howl, they don't, um, they sing the song of their people, they don't, um, they don't just bark. Look at your sleepy little face, yes, good girl, yes indeed, she's very sleepy. Hi buddy, good girl, yeah, good girl, good girl. Um, so yeah, so she, she definitely, she howls. She doesn't just, uh, she's getting so big. She's getting huge. It's absurd. And she still won't go up and down our main stairs, which on the one hand, I kind of appreciate because it means that she, we can have her up on the, like up stairs and um, you know, like I can have the studio door open and I know that she's, she can run down the hall and she go, can go into the bedroom, but that she won't go like run downstairs and assign herself a new peeing spot. Um, but the issue with that is she's getting quite heavy and she needs to be taken out still very, very frequently. Um, like now that I've woken her up, um, as soon as she starts moving around, right now she's still just doing her roly polies, showing us her belly. Yes, it's a very cute belly. Good belly. Good belly. Good girl. Yes, good girl. Um, but now that she's been moved, she'll probably wake up pretty soon. Um, and then I'll have to take her outside. Uh, but right now I've been carrying her up and down the stairs a lot, which is getting a lot harder as she gets bigger. Those eye markings look totally fake. I think you painted them on. Also, you outlined her ears with black paint. Stretch. Oh gosh, like her markings are ridiculous. She's got uh, the, the, the glasses on her face, the little spots on her belly. Yes, spots, I'm a Dalmatian. Spots, hi. Are you ridiculous? Are you ridiculous? Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. And then, I'm not sure if you can see it, um, but there's, they're gradually appearing. She's got stripes on her legs. <laughs> um, so she definitely got, do her paws smell like Cheetos? Uh, probably. Her ears smell something special. 
she was smelling, she was quite stinky for a while because she had, when we got her, the food that she had been on gave her diarrhea. So she had impacted glands and then she digs and dumps her face in water all the time. So her ears were all damp. So she got ear infection. So now we have to, yeah, whatever. Stinky puppy breath. No, it's not, it's not breath. Her breath smells like regular puppy breath. That's, she had an ear infection and glands. Anyway, mostly better now. We're treating it. But we have to treat neuron too, because if neuron does it, then it's okay. Anyway, um, I have to take this puppy out now, so uh, bye. Amber, say bye to the people. Say bye. Do you want to sing them a song? Like how unfair your life is and you only get treats sometimes. No. Queen? Drama queen? No. I'm perfect. I'm cleaning myself. Oh, the cat's also t been teaching her how to clean herself, so she's picking up some cat behaviors, which is hilarious. Bye! <laughs> yeah. Belly! Belly! Oh my goodness, what a good belly. Belly, she sleeps like that. That's her favorite sleeping position. So she'll, she wants to curl up. She has a little basket that she likes curling up into. She needs me to tuck her in. She yells at me until I tuck her in. Then I tuck her in. She spends about five minutes in there and then she finds a bare patch of floor usually. It's a little bit cooler now. So she's sleeping on stuff. Usually it would be a bare patch of floor if it was warmer. Um, she does like soft things, she just can't usually handle the warmth. And then she sleeps like this. It can be 8 degrees out, this is a sleeping position. Anyway, bye! <laughs> we need to go outside. Take the goofy little wolf outside. Yeah, outside! Bye! Say bye to the people! Say bye! Do you talk? You talk all the time. You gonna to talk to the camera? No? Me talk, me drama queen. Give me belly rubs. Yes, humph. Why no belly rubs? Do we want to do a tiny bit of training before we go outside? We can do a tiny bit of training before we go outside. Hey, buds. Just a tiny bit. Yeah. Look, he's belly, belly. Yes, good belly. Yes, you're already in a belly position. That one was easy. That one was easy. Uh -huh. Do you want to do more training? Or do you want just belly? You just want belly rubs? Amber touch? Yes, that's a good touch. But girl, are you going to do all your touch on your back? That would be a new thing. Paw? Do you do paw while on your back? Paw? Oh, that's a good paw. Good girl. Yeah, maybe not with the teeth. Other paw? Oh, other paw. Good girl. Touch? No, that's not touch. I don't know what that is, but it's not touch. That is teethies. You don't want to, you don't want to move. You just want to be on your back. Touch. Okay. I'll accept that. You're goofy. You're goofy. You're made of goofiness. I don't think you're doing very many tricks though. No. 
Remember high five? Do you do high five while on your back? No? Only when you're sitting? This looks like an awful lot of teeth and not an awful lot of doing tricks. High five? No. Uh -uh. You do high five when you're sitting. We're still working on a lot of behavioral stuff, but um, she needs the mental stimulation, so she's doing all sorts of goofy tricks like belly and rollover and paw, the other paw and high five and whatever that aren't, they don't serve any purpose really, um, other than they're easy to teach and do reps of when she needs mental stimulation. <laughs> So we are, we're teaching her all sorts of things because they're easy to teach rather than because we actually need them, need her to do them. Um, because what would be really important for her to learn is to pee in the right place and to not pull on her leash and maybe to actually heal. and not tear around the house like a maniac. But those things, it turns out, that behavior modification stuff takes a lot longer to train. Especially when your doggy has all kinds of attitude. Oh, oh, what are we doing? No, you don't get to serve yourself treats. You want treats, you have to do tricks. Oh, yummy, Amber. Well, so this scratching is because of the silly ear infection. Amber, sit. Well, you're not being very obedient today. Sit. What happened to sit? Yeah. Excuse me. You want tricks? You want tricks? You're going to have to do your tricks. What is this? What is this attitude? You just want to lie around? Sit? Uh-huh. You? No, I don't know what that is. I don't know what this is. That's not a trick. That's not a minute. I said sit. Yes. Who's going to sit? Oh, okay. All right. Here we go. Hey, can we sit properly? Yes, good girl. Down? Good girl. Yes. Yes, good girl. Good girl. And the sit. Good girl. Yes, paw. Okay, once you're done scratching. Yes, good girl, yes. Other paw. Yes, good girl. Good girl, yes, that's a good girl. You're a good girl. down, huh? Yes. Good girl. Good girl. Stand. That's not stand. I don't know what that is. Stand. Good girl. <laughs> what is this? What is this? That's not standing. That's showing the attitude and clacking your teeth. Well, this is an accurate representation of what you're like much of the time. When she's in a mood to do her tricks, she does all of them perfectly and holds positions. And when she's not, we get this. Ember, let's touch. That's that's with your mouth. Touch. Uh-uh. No, 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 no biting. Uh-uh. None of this is accepted. No. No biting. Uh-uh. No biting. Ember. No biting. No. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I know. Now this is just this is just attitude. Touch. Okay. 
can you try touch without your teeth this time? No. No bite. No. Amber, touch. Without the teeth, please. Huff. Yes, I know you, but you would prefer if touch involved teeth, but it doesn't. Touch. Still no. Still no teeth. It's very unfair you wish all the tricks involved teeth. She tries to add teeth to all her tricks, especially when she's tired and frustrated because now, now she's messed it up. So now we're getting attitude. So this is attitude. Ember, no, no teeth, no teeth. Well done, yeah, good girl. Ember, touch. Can I get a touch? Okay, I will accept that. Good girl. Yes. Touch. Yeah, that's a good girl. But if I put it over here, Ember, touch. Touch. With a pretty, please. I can do this and oh no you're not you're not behaving today sit and I can put it right beside her face and watch her not go for it eventually she looks away good girl yes She's clearly not in a mood for training, but that's some of the stuff we're working on. She's grumpy right now. She's so cute. Yeah, she is pretty grumpy right now. Um, yeah, are you going to hunt me through the bed? You're allowed to do that. That's fine. Um, yes. She's a little bit of a grumpus right now. She, her nap was short, which is fine because now we're gonna go get some exercise and then maybe her next nap and her night's rest will be better. Anyway, bye. Anyway, that, that'll be it now, finally. Yes, bye. <laughs>